battling and building for this. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you happy to be here? Praise the Lord. I see Sister Kelly from Ontario still here. So praise the Lord. That's good to see. And different ones. Let's just stand and look to the Lord this, this morning. Any requests as we would look to the Lord? Your father, yes. Still in the same condition. Unspoken. Okay. Unspoken. All right. Unspoken. Although they're unspoken, he knows. He does. He knows every intent and every thought. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace. Lord, we have come here, Lord, to worship and praise thee, Lord. But, Lord, you've seen the question, Lord, the, those that have things on their mind, Lord, that they have needs of, Lord. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would look upon them and meet the needs, Lord. Let thy spirit, I pray, Lord, remove every burden, every problem that may be in the way, Lord, and that we may be set free, Lord, to worship thee and to praise thee. And, Lord, we're ever so thankful, Lord, that you have kept us this far, and we know, Lord, that you will keep us till our day of our redemption. Lord, we also pray for that nation of Israel. Amen. So one of these days, Lord, you will move miraculously on their behalf. And, Lord, we're ever so thankful for your word. In Christ Jesus' name I pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated and have some leaders come lead us in our service. Mr. Lord, good to see everyone this morning. Um, try 150 in the blue book. When I'm tossed on life's sea and the waves they Walk the 
have heard how Christians long ago they were brought before a tyrant's throne they were told that he would spare their lives they would renounce the name of Christ one by one they chose Like a great angelic choir sing, I can almost hear your voices ring. I pledge allegiance to with all my strength and all that I am. I will see. Now the years have come and the years have gone, but the cause of Jesus goes on, and the time has come to count the cost to reject this world and embrace the cross. Down 
his hand for me when he reached down his hand for me I was lost and undone without this morning 155 Thank you Lord. <clears throat> Jesus is mine, oh what a fortress, glory divine, here to salvation, purchase of God,
191 in the blue book. Do you know the, I know the chorus.
the Lord because he lives. <clears throat> 300 in the red book. Sister Monique, 179. Sister Monique, do you have a song afterwards?
Thank you, Lord. to thank the Lord this morning. He's so good to me and wonderful. I don't deserve it. It's not uh, anything that we can do, but it is by his grace and his righteousness. Um, Friday night, as it was uh, getting windier, and uh, usually that doesn't bother me or make me nervous any, but... uh, for some reason, because of the, I have a tree um, between my house and my neighbors, and I knew it was uh, getting older, and the branch was leaning much towards their land, and I wasn't sure if it was even like the tree belonged to just me or both of our our uh, property. But anyways, I had called the three um, people that uh, come to. Uh, cut the trim the trees and that and uh, he was going to come during the week but finally he was able to come uh, and that morning Friday morning and he left his card in the, in the mailbox and uh, anyways uh, I, I wasn't thinking that it was going to be that uh, windy that night but uh, I was just tired and I just looked at it and I thought well Jesus, I just whispered the name of Jesus and went to bed not too long after. And the next day, well, the other neighbor tree had fell, like in my yard, and the other branch or the other tree was still there. And well, thank you, Lord, that you take care of the smallest of matters. And uh, I just appreciate it. Great him enough for the cross of Calvary. I could never thank him enough for salvation full and free. I could never do.
People said I'd never make it I'd never see it through They don't know what keeps me going I guess they never have found you All my life was a shamble Till the day you came along You turned my tears into laughter You gave me a brand new song
bringing hope and cheer. It's the lovely name of Jesus. Evermore the There came a sound from heaven. Oh, I come by you Yeah. 
your wife was ruined and wasted, and your soul was bound for Adam. Oh, but then she met the master, and he told. Yeah.
I thought of that verse, first song we sang. Uh, yeah, forget it. Uh, the first couple of lines in it. Don't let the things of earth hide sweet heaven's view. For you got one more valley, one more hill. And it's the enemy's trick today to get us so involved in earthly things that, that we lose sight of heaven. We, we don't view heaven anymore like we, like we used to. <clears throat> and by experience, I have 
I've learned that it's good to keep your keep your eyes focused on on the things that are ahead in, when it comes to heaven and the resurrection and so forth. And uh, the Lord has helped me very much uh, in that way in the last while back since Audrey passed away. Not to dwell too much on on the earthly things, but to get our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that are waiting us down the road. Don't let the devil hide sweets to heaven's view. I want to try and sing the last mile of the way. I don't know what key it's in. I don't have a number. I don't have a number here. Yeah, that might be all right. Yeah. <coughs> okay. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I were till the close of the day, I shall see the great King. When I'm gone the last mile <clears throat> When I'm gone the last mile all the way I will rest at the close of the day And I
we'd all stand now and uh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, we are we're so yeah. thankful, Lord. We thank you for thy spirit that's able to minister to each one. But, Lord, as we look in your word, I just pray, Lord, you would have your way. In thy wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. We see that this morning... If I was to uh, give it a title, I would call it this morning, The Order Concerning the Judgment Seat of Christ. There are scriptures that the Lord has in his word. That once you see them put in place, they reveal a beautiful picture in this end time. As I was getting ready last night, my brother called, and, and I know the subject is not for novice, but then again, the bride needs something meat too in the hour that we live in. And he got talking about the things that God has opened up in the last while. His heart is really thrilled in the things. It's God that's brought it. I know that after I had that blood cloth and I almost passed away that I thought that was pretty well it, you know. I couldn't see much further in the word of God, but God has a way of changing things around. And so as we talked about how the Lord's coming, how that I could see it in the face of different ones, uh, not just here, they're thrilled about what God is doing. It gives life to the inner person that God is still feeding meat in here in the end time. And it's God's choice who he wishes to use. And I'm thankful that it's not just one man, that it's more than, than one that God uses this, in this hour. And so while we were talking about the different things that the Lord has done in the last three well, since January or February, if you want to, not last three months, it's been a little while now. But how that it all came in bunches. It came quickly. Not that I had to go searching for it. Uh, in the early mornings, the Lord would just drop something in, and then from that would go on to something else, and the picture would open up. Now, to some say, well, it's just your imagination. Well, that's fine with you. Go ahead. But I know, for me, that it's true. And God was able to bring things through. And in these last, uh, from, from the beginning of the year, the things we didn't know before, not big things, just little things led to other little things, which led to a, finally, to a picture that the Lord wants to reveal. And the things... In this last, well, I'd say it took place probably in the space of four months or so, or five, we got to see what the time and the season was about for this hour. 
how that the, that the times has ended, the centuries has ended. Very small nugget. God had, op- had allowed it to be opened. It was there all the time. Like the song we sing, it was there. He was there all the time. Well, that scripture was there all the time. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, uh, that generation shall not pass away till all things f- be fulfilled. It doesn't say that's the last 100 years. But if we know what a generation is, you know it ain't going to be no more 100 years. So God dropped that in. Then the next thing that came along, in the, very on the heels of it, was the three watches of Luke chapter uh, 12. How that, no, in Luke itself in 12 and 38, doesn't say there's three, but he talks about a second and a third. These watches, what are these watches for? It's watching concerning his coming. And I know that in, that wa- in the, those two watches, the second and the third, the first watch is found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 10. It had to do with the ministries, how God moved from one, one major ministry or period of time to the next, to the next. We moved from the days of Brother Branham, God using him to reveal things from 63 on, through Brother Jackson, and what a glorious time we've had, uh, some almost 38 or 40 years of God using that vessel of clay. And then now we're in the, in the five-fold ministry. And God has not left us without anything. Something, because if, if there was no more food, no more fresh revelation, we are going to go in circles. People will get hungry. And people will start slowly drifting away from the message. Because food is what makes you and I hunger that keeps alive. And, and when, he, when he called, he surprised me. And I said, he's on fire. And only God can do that to a vessel of clay. Then from the three watches, the following thing that dropped, God dropped in is concerning the judgment seat of Christ. How that can only fit in the half hour silence. And not only that they fit in the half hour silence, but there's two parts to it. There's a judgment on the earth in the quick and a judgment in heaven for the, for the dead deceased bride. Along with that, couple in, in, the, in that half hour silence that makes the picture beautiful. Also, that angel in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, that he offers all the prayers at that time. And you would think by offering all the prayers at that time, that would be Jesus' role to do that. Because offering the prayer, he, remember, he's in heaven, he's before the throne, he has a high function office to do that, but it's an angelic being being there. And, well, you say, well, maybe you're drawn for straw to find out who it was. Well, that's maybe your opinion. But when I look at Melchizedek, he was a type. It was an angelic being that that met Abraham. And if this priest in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, is working in the order of a priesthood, and bingo, there... Who else could it be, unless God has another Melchizedek or somebody, another angel that ministers in that function? But I kind of like to believe this morning that it is Melchizedek in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. That would be over here. Now, as we were talking, and it came back to the time. Now, when you talk about dreams, people get leery. They can trust Brother Jackson's dreams, Brother Branham's dream, but the only way you get to know a dream is true, time will prove that it is or not. So I'm not saying you believe it this morning. But in December 28, in year 2000, way back, I mentioned this dream here before, how that in the dream, I was told that Brother Jackson was coming to Moncton. Now, he, by that time, Brother Jackson was still alive. And so I wanted much to talk to him 
but I had no opportunity to talk to him. You know how it is when he comes, a lot of people wants to, to talk with him, and sometimes things just, you don't go barging in and being unpolite and say, hey, I want to talk to you right now. And so, so I waited. Then as that changed, now the scene changes. I see myself in a classroom, in a schoolroom, but school is out as far as the secular school is concerned, and the chairs are arranged in different kind of a way. And so as I'm walking in this classroom and I'm looking around, here Brother Jackson comes, and he comes in the front on a blackboard. It was there. Then I sat myself down, moved the desk to face the where, where he was looking at that blackboard, and, and I noticed there was a few, a few that were there, but not many, very few. And so as he's, he's now dictating of things that are transpiring in a futuristic point of view, and as he's, he's bringing forth these things, it's coming so quick. I had I tried to write them down, but no sooner had I wrote it down, he was off on something else that was going through. So at the end of it, I was kind of disappointed because I wish I would have wrote them all down, and not only in the dream, but uh, in actual uh, actuality on the paper as well. So as, as that finishes, and at the end, as he's finishing up, he's, he, then Brother Jackson goes through the blackboard, and all the while, he draws a circle and places a straight line on top of it. And on top of this drawing, he begins to write some scriptures there. But the things were so fast, I had no time to finish the drawing as he wrote about four or five scriptures, and things were going, and this was pointing to things at the end. At that time, in two, year 2000, I thought, well, things are going, going fine. The Lord, yes, started, I had just barely started the ministry, started in 98. And Lord dealt with some things that, that needed to be dealt with, but they were not fresh meat per se, but just to bring things in the right perspective. And so over time, yes, as Brother Jackson passed away, there was little things like the sevenfold light, how that came through, uh, the two days of Hosea, that came through. But these were just in between things. And what brought me to this morning to this dream that things were running so fast and so quick, I believe it's pointing to the, the time we just have gone through. These things that God has opened up quickly. And I believe God didn't want me to know what it was before it's time. Because if we know before it's time, we try to figure things up and put things around and try to put things into place. And God didn't want man to put his own ideas into the whole situation. So that was that dream. Then I've heard lately about concerning this end time, there's a brother that had the chart. And they're looking at the time of the miraculous and that nobody has con tested it. Well, nobody has tested it, brought it up to him because all you're going to do if you, if you do that, you're going to get an argument. But God has revealed that the, ti the time of the miraculous has not started in 2004. Have you seen God on the scene doing miraculous things in a mighty, in a mighty manner more than so before? No, I haven't. The miracle war has not happened, so that picture could not be right. But then, in 2009, in June the 21st, I was caught up in the dream again in the early morning. And in this, in this dream, I was con I could s on my mind there was looking at the chronicle, the chronology, chronology of the Book of Revelation. And so as I was looking at that. Then the Spirit says, what are you looking at? And I was looking at that time concerning the chapter 2 of Revelation, Jesus among the candlestick. And it was asked, what do you see? Well, I said, it's the church ages. And the Spirit comes back and says, well, what does the word age means? 
And so then as I was looking at the, what, what, what ages mean, well, it's a time factor. And while he says it's a time factor for the Gentiles. And the Spirit said, but what about the word ages mean? So, yeah. He referred to it as time. Then he said, for what purpose? I said, the Jews will be cut off until the Gentile bride goes in. And he said, what will happen? It will happen at the end. I will explain. Then I'll turn immediately and revive the Jews. Then, as I was made to understand that the two days of Hosea, six and two, is the time factor is the same as the Gentile church age. I was in a dream in 2009. Then there came as that, at, at that time, there became a lot of controversy about the two days of Hosea. One said this, and one said that, and, and the other thing. So it, for two years, about two years later, in a, in a dream again, I see in the dream Brother Jackson coming, and I was somewhere near the East Coast at the time, and he was busy uh, uh, with things going on at the time, setting up for the meeting and so forth. And I said to myself, if I ever get a chance to talk to him, I would like to talk to him about the situation that's going on now, because there, it was a warfare, really, about the two days. And no sooner that he said that, there he was. He was before me. I said, I want to ask you more about the week of Daniel in Hosea. But before I could ask the question and finish my question, he says, I know about the controversy. You go preach what you received. Speaking about 2009. Then the dream ended. And in my heart, I wanted him ask, ask him more about things, about the ceiling and 144,000. You know how we always have questions. But these were two were dreams that were instrumental. And it still stands today concerning the two days of Hosea is the Gentile time frame. Because when, it, when the Hosea 6 and 2 ends, when the Gentile age ends, then you are in the week of Daniel without a shadow of a doubt. So that is being as it may, I just thought I'd re report this morning that God has not left us without giving us something. He could have chose anyone to do this with. And sometimes, like we all say, well, why do you choose me to do that? Because a lot of hot water comes with it. And so we have gone now... We're in this third watch. And we're looking at the voice of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 52, to lifting up the voice. Well, first of all, we, the, we can say, well, the voice, yeah, that's the message. Yes, but what is the origin of it? The origin is in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 25 that you forsake not him that speaketh from heaven. And him speaking from heaven didn't end in 2004 or 2005 when Brother Jackson passed away. Then there's the carcass. The carcass has not stopped in 2004. But here's the whole thing. If we're not moving forward with what's described as the spirit of prophecy in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. That started in 1963. How many sees it? Where is it? How's he accomplishing it? And it seems the majority has more or less put that aside 
and just basically dwelled in what was already brought forth. And there's, please, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Because as young people, they need to have that ministry too. But there's been a rejection of the things that God has been bringing down through time. When I look at other things that God has brought in this hour, somewhere this is going to, God's going to prove it out. If I'm false, God will raise somebody else up and use the word, and it will destroy the picture. But thus far, nothing has happened. So why? I mean, it astounds me. Here's a brother. He's not ministering. He's only been saved maybe some 10 years or so. He's not been in the message from way, way back. But he sees this. He was expounding concerning the judgment seat of Christ, how, the, how beautiful he was preaching to me. <laughs> now, if a, a simple brother can see it like that, then why not the ministry? There's got to be a problem. Could be attitudes, could be whatever it is, Maybe it's not their, their time. I don't know. But if you're not willing to look, you'll never know. So as we are looking this morning concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that judgment seat cannot happen. Here's one thing also yeah, that I picked up of what Brother Brown had said. He says, as, as long as the blood is on the mercy seat, show that something died, it holds the judgment back. Now, yes, it's the judgment of the sinners in the day of the Lord, but it also holds back the judgment seat of Christ. So that's why we've been saying, while Jesus is sitting on the mercy seat, Till he peels that seventh seal, no judgment of the bride saint that has to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take place. So therefore, it has to be somewhere after that seventh seal is broke. We know it can't be at the wedding supper. He's not going to judge his wife. And we know it's not in the millennium because we're going to be sitting on thrones with him. And there's other scriptures that sort of come into place here as, as maybe I'll review this as much as I can in a, in a short space of time here. All this hinged on one scripture that was in the epistles. It was laying there for ever since Jesus spoke back in 33 AD, or 30 AD, whenever the time was he actually spoke it when he was here on earth. That's in Luke chapter 19. From there, that scripture identifies one part of the judgment seat. But as men read it over time in Luke chapter 19, verse 15, Because time-wise and situation-wise, it puts Jesus in angelic form as, his project, as the angel projects the image of Christ. He's here on the earth. And all down through time, man has looked at the judgment seat of Christ as being up in heaven, and that's the only place it'll ever be. But this Luke chapter 19, verse 15, now identifies that it's going to, a part of it that's going to happen down here on the earth. That alone on itself is not enough. But then when we look at the time frame, when we go through the book of Revelation this morning, in chapter 5, 
we're going to see the events and the scriptures that leads up that we're going to point to that Luke chapter 19. And so as we go to Revelation chapter 5, In that fifth chapter, it starts out with the one that's sitting on the throne. And, who's, and the angels tell John, who's worthy to open the book? And John could see no man that was worthy. Now, it's not as if he didn't have no knowledge of certain things, because remember, when he walked on earth, he said, that's the Lamb of God. And if there's anyone that's worthy, it's the only begotten Son of God. How John was a beautiful writer that the Lord used to explain the Godhead, its relationship. So he knew in his mind who would be worthy. But as the angel asked him, he says, Who's worthy? And he's looking around in heaven and he doesn't see Jesus. Why does he not see him? Now remember, John walked with him for three and a half years. He knew who he was. So as he's looking around in heaven, he could probably see the other apostles that are there. Because time-wise, you are now, John was brought into 1963. He's looking in heaven and he sees his fallen brethren, they're there. And he's looking for Jesus too. But the one that's sitting on the throne, he can't see him because Jesus is now in, a, in such a brilliant light. Just like he was on Mount Transfiguration. And John's an apostle that don't take guesses. He wants to make sure. Because when we go back to Revelation chapter 1, he says, there was one like unto the Son of Man, while well, he couldn't see his features to say for sure whether it was him or an angel. But it's an angel that was portraying it in chapter 1, the book of Revelation. So now as he's looking at that throne, he sees that brilliant one. Had he seen his physical feature, he says, he's the one. But he doesn't, so he's looking around. And so he begins to cry, he was wondering where, where did he go? If you want to read in between the lines. And I wept much that no man was found worthy to open the book, neither to look thereupon. Then one of the elders said unto him, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. Now he knew who that was. Has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So now we're talking about the time of opening the seals. Yes, the seals, as you are back here in time in 1963, Jesus gets up and he peels six of them. But this chapter 5 covers a space of time. It covers a space of time till actually all the seals are peeled. And you'd have to drop down to verse 9. Now we're starting to see it as the... As as that half hour silence has started according to Revelation 8 and 1, there was a silence in heaven. Why is there a silence? Nobody could talk? No, no more revelation coming from that throne is what the silence is. And some are still leery about that today. If it's silence then, from 1963 to now, it's quite a bit long time to be silent, wouldn't it? But revelatory silence, sorry, from when he comes off that seat, sorry, that there's that silence that starts. There's going to be thunders going to be unfolded. There's going to be prophesying to tongues of nations and so forth. That will take time. So being silent for all that period of time, I don't care if you have a resurrected body. You're still you as you as you and we are what we are. 
Because we have a resurrected body. Your mind, the way you think, the way you act, the soul that you are, the only thing is when we, when we come to receive our full measure, when we, we measure the Spirit of God, and then we have a resurrected body. But that don't make you so different that you, you're not even you anymore. All right. So in verse 9 it says, They sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Now, granted, that took a space of time because six was done in six, 1963. But somewhere up ahead, that seven one is going to be open. So it's looking at the part where all the seals will be opened. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us. That's the reason he's worthy to open it. By the blood of every kindred, tongues, and nations, and so forth. So now in verse 9, he actually... It's the climax of him opening that last seventh seal. And thou hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, you're still in the heavenly realm here. He's opened that seventh one. You're still in the heavenly realm in verse 10 and verse 11. In verse 11, it shows you here, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Where's that? It's in glory, not on the earth. The beasts, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million. That's not a small crowd. And then there was thousands of, of thousands. That's a large number that nobody knows how big that is even there. So there's a great number in heaven. Now, all this great multitude that's up in heaven. You're still in heaven. He's just finished peeling that seventh one. And it shows how many is there at the, to give witness. And then they, they all say this in heaven to Jesus, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Who's that lamb that was slain? That's none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. To receive power. Riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing. The key little word, he says, to receive. In other words, he's given the authority for it, but he's not moved into his kingdom. So now he's opened the seventh seal. The crowd in heaven says, you're worthy to receive power, wisdom, and so forth. I know we went through that before in other messages. So now you are time-wise, if you can look at the chart here, the seventh seal's open, then you drop immediately to identify the time in the time frame, and it's in heaven, before that angel can come, Revelation 5 and 12, they have to give honor, he has received the authority. Okay, now having received the authority, now that angel can start making his descent in Revelation chapter 10. And as he makes his descent, he's got one foot on land, one foot on the sea. It's universal. It's just not universal just for the, for the, to see an angel. But there's going to be multifunctions that he's going to be doing. He's going to cry with his voice. Now when he cries with his voice, Yes, it's the, through the angel, but it is Christ being portrayed that that voice is sounding. You and I are not going to see the angel. We're going to see the image of Christ as he sounds that voice because he's coming to reveal himself to the bride, not just by revelatory understanding, but by a vision as well. Well, so the, how can you stretch that? That same angel in the week of Daniel to the woman in 144,000 shows Jesus with the nail-scarred hands and the pierced side. Now you tell me if he can do that there, how is he going to reveal himself here in that half-hour silence? You following so far? So the next thing on order, 
the scripture that points to the place that opens up a whole lot of things is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 15, if we go there now. Or even before we go there, I want to read you a few, uh, few scripture. You'll find in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, you can just write the number down. I'll just read it to you. And there was given unto him, speaking about Jesus, there was given to him dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is from everlasting to everlasting and shall not pass away. And his kingdom shall that, sorry, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. In Daniel, the 18th verse, you're still in that same chapter. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. When we get our reward, we're going to be speaking later on, we receive it at the same time that he takes the kingdom. And shall possess the kingdom forever and ever. Now forever and ever, it's not eternal. It's like that what I was saying that I use all the time. A man goes to the mall with his wife. To her, it's real fast. To him, it seems like forever. Okay? You can say that about the men, too, when they go to the band store. Right? When you're waiting for him. All right. So it works both ways. So in Daniel 7.27, in that same chapter, And the kingdoms and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now, that's another part of the message I wanted to touch, but in Revelation chapter 3, 21, Jesus is speaking in this wise. To him that overcome, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. What does that mean? How are you going to fit 10 million people on one chair? Is that what it's implying? It's the same authority when he sits. It's at the same time. At the with the same authority. So he's going to be ruling out to wherever the bride is at. All right. Let, um, now I want to go back to where we've been looking at. So all these scriptures are pointing to that he's receiving power. Now in Daniel, is he's actually coming into possession of it. While in the book of Revelation, he's told he's to receive it. All right? So, but it confirms one or the other that he is given a kingdom, wisdom, knowledge, glory, and all these things. And wisdom, well, it's not the wisdom that he had when he walked on earth concerning the coin, but it's wisdom like Solomon to rule that millennium. Power is the power to rule, not the power to be as a, as a high priest, because it's a transitional point in time. Now, as we are Come to the place where we've seen he's given the authority that all take place in heaven before the angel comes down. But when the angel does come down, we know about the voice of the archangel, that he cries in the thunders and so forth. But in looking in the overall, as that angel does come down, part of his work is found in Luke chapter 19, if we want to turn there now. And this drives the majority of this message up the wall. But I ain't going to stop. So in Luke, the 19th chapter. And in verse 15. Now we're talking about, and it came to pass when he was returned. Returned where? Well, he was up in glory where he received the commission. 
He's not personally coming, the physical, immortal Lord Jesus Christ is not coming in the himself, but he's sending an angelic being that's going to portray this to you and I. So that's fulfilling verse, chapter 19, verse 15. And it came to pass when he was returned, and here identifies him, that who it belongs to, having received the kingdom. Where did he get that? Just prior to that angel coming down, he was told by everybody in heaven, Jesus is to receive power, dominion, blessing, and so forth. So that's where it's happening. Now that he has it, now we, you put Luke. And somewhere in that half hour silence, that's where this is taking place. And when he comes, he's not in the wedding supper, and he's not somewhere in the grace age, nor the millennium. He's in that half hour silence. Now, when we talk about coming before the judgment seat of Christ, and there's a whole bunch of scriptures concerning that. Shall I read some of you of concerning what it pertains to? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, you can just mark it down the number. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward, not a general reward, according to his own labor. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Judge nothing before its time until the Lord comes. Not that, he, that, the, that the Holy Ghost came to you in that time. It's in this half hour silence as he's come in Luke chapter 19. So therefore judge nothing before its time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifested the counsel of the heart, then every man shall have praise of God. So there's an appointed day, there's an appointed time, and a, that God is going to be doing these, allowing these things to take place through the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if... If you're new to the Bible, it's not every soul that's in heaven that's coming before the judgment seat of Christ. It's only the bride of Jesus Christ. Because this judgment is not to determine your salvation, it's to determine your reward. So we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. In Romans, chapter 14, verse 10. Why does thy set thy brother or not? Shall we, all, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is again. So somewhere, if we're all going to stand there, and, it's all, and he's appointed one day, another scripture talks about, he's appointed one day where he's going to do this. It's not a day of 24 hours. It means a time, place, somewhere. He's not going to do it while there's the mercy seat, the blood's on the mercy seat. It's not time at the wedding supper, so the only place it can be is in this half hour silence. Now, as he's down here in Luke chapter 19, verse 15, that we were looking at, as he is down here, and as we're reading that Luke chapter 19, it says this, it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom. So that identifies as the Lord, but being down here on earth, because he hasn't come for his bride, for his rapture, and he's not his second coming. So it has to be through that angelic being of Revelation chapter 10. Having received the kingdom, so he received that before the angel came down. Then, while he's on earth, On two feet on the ground, if you want to. Then he commanded those servants, these servants, not all servants, these servants. Who are these? They are living servants that have now come into this half hour silence. They are alive. 
And he called unto them that they should give them that he should that he had given the money that he might know how much every man has gained by trading. What is this all about? It doesn't say this is the judgment seat of Christ, but what is the judgment seat of Christ? He's given the ministry and the body of Christ a certain amount of measure, and when he comes for that judgment, he's not judging the salvation, he's judging what your reward is going to be. So as he's looking at the different servants, as we would read down from there, as one servant had one pound, he increased ten pounds. So he's being judged before the judgment seat of Christ. It's taking place down here. Oh, but we can't see that. We've always been told it's how everybody's going to be judged in heaven. Yeah, that's right. But God opens things up. When you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead. Or in the King James, it's the quick and the dead. That's your bride saints. Now remember, the judgment seat of Christ is not for every people that has eternal, that's going to have eternal life. It's to this bride. So he's going to judge both the living and the dead. Is he going to do this at a different time? No, that's why the angel comes down to us. There's the living. We are the quick that have moved in that half hour. He's going to be judging his bride at that moment and that hour. That'll be after the thunders have transpired. And before we prophesy the tongues, nation, and so forth, that judgment takes place at that particular time. And that angel is universal. You don't have to fly to Indiana to go find, to get, to come before the judgment seat of Christ if you're living at that hour. He is universal. That angel can, tra can travel quicker than you and I can. Like that picture I showed about how the, every eye shall see him, the Lord's coming. Well, he doesn't move, the earth moves around, and in 24 hours he can be he's seen by everybody. Now if he wants to, he can drop down on anyone at any place. So this angel can do the same. He can be wherever the bright element is at. So he's going to judge the quick. Now, as he's judging the quick down here, now, I'll let you guess how many number there is, whether it's two, seven thousand, ten thousand, I don't know how many there is. But there won't be a whole big number going down in that millennium. Uh, uh, sorry, they'll be going in that half hour for that judgment. But up in glory, as we spoke in another message, the bride, the deceased bride, can, saints can be as many as 10 million or 7, whatever the number is. Whether it's 7 million or whether it's 10, how do you judge each individual? Because each individual has to come individually before him. And he tells them because their individual reward, it's not a, a, car, it's not a, a general thing. Okay, everybody gets this reward. We all have to come before him. And I know things you tap can move quicker in the spirit realm, but somewhere to judge every individual coming before him if there is 10 million. Can you do that in six months? No way in the world. Well, where'd you get all that? Well, wherever you got your head, in the moon? How long does it take? Now, men on the earth conducts interviews. It's not be like an interview on the earth where you're spending an hour for each person that's being interviewed because it's not that kind of an interview. You're not an interview for a job. Well, one way it is, you're going to be ruling and reigning. And he has all the facts about you. But the Spirit of God is there in through him, knows every secret of whether we've done good or bad. Now, so I can see why some people, do. well, I'm, I might be nervous in front of you. If you're there, you're assured of eternal life, period. 
Sure, you might lose a lot, but you still have eternal life. Praise God. So, now, that's where that Luke chapter 19 has come into relevance in this hour. It was always there, but God allowed it to be brought forth to show us that the judgment seat of Christ has now taken place in that half hour silence. One part is going to be done on the earth through that angelic being, and the majority is going to be done in heaven through, that, through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now here's something else. Maybe just to add little, little things to it a little bit. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, we read the scripture, but really this adds to this picture here that we're looking at here this morning. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Okay, so it's been there. There's a crown of righteousness for every believer. It's laid there. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in at that day. When? You receive your crown. Right here. During that time. But, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. That's when you get that crown. These scriptures are coming alive. I don't know about you, but I just love it. And I don't understand why the ministry of this hour don't even care about it. It shows me that the spirit, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is spirit of, of prophecy, is not working there. Because if the spirit was there, it would see the same thing that God's bringing on ground. Something gone ar uh, awry somewhere. Do the Branham camp and all their wonderful I mean, there's a whole lot of preachers that are in the Branham movement. Do they care anything about what's going on here now? No. But when that half hour comes, they'll be caught off guard and surprised because they didn't know what was transpiring in this space of time. And the same could happen to the Jackson movement. If they don't wake up, because him that hath his household broken in. Why did Jesus say to watch? He's not asking you to watch on fundamental doctrines, which is necessary. And it has to be preached for those new ones that are coming in. But if that's all the area I'm going to play with, with Brother Brown's message, Brother Jackson's message, you're going to fall short in this hour that it is the hour of the fivefold ministry, God has brought something on ground. Well, you should speak it softly. When Brother Branham needed to upbraid some of the denominational, I heard him speak some pretty stern stuff and he didn't go, well, it'd be nice for you that tongues is not an evidence, you know. No, he said, tongues is not an evidence. He had, the spirit was constraining him to speak that way. Yes, this time in, in his earlier ministry, he would show love. And, th and that's well and fine too. But we're looking at the, bringing this bride to a completion somewhere. So what's lifting up the voice is not just lifting up the voice of Brother Brown or Brother Jackson. What about the voice in this hour? And if they are not, if the bride is not, well, shouldn't say the bride. If there's a number that don't even care, then they're not lifting up. They'll be missing a part of the voice to lift up at the end. They'll be fall short in that third watch. They'll fall short of all these things that we have come into an understanding. And uh, as I was speaking in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, 
that we, is, there's laid up a crown of righteousness for you and I. Isn't it nice to know when you're going to get your crown? At his appearing. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, it says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Hallelujah! <laughs> when? When he appears. For his physical second coming? No. How are we getting that, that crown? Oh, it's just when our bodies change? No, you're going to know the crown you're going to get. Now, what is that crown? It's a crown of life, but it's also a crown for ruling and reigning with him. And you're going to know what your crown entails in ruling with the Lord in the millennium. Not as we go up in the, in the rapture, oh, I got a crown now. The crown has also entailed with it where you and I are going to be ruling, reigning. Now we have received eternal life even before we get to that judgment. You and I have eternal life now. But you don't have your crown now. It's reserved in glory for you and me. Am I going too long here? Oh, well, we were a little long singing. It's all right, sometimes it's... I'll maybe touch this next week. Looking at the day of the Lord in his physical second coming. When it says there's a remnant, it's going to be left over. Now, I'm not going to point out some numbers just to these are the numbers, but just to give a perception of what we're looking at. This morning I looked on Google. Google has some things, sometimes some good things if you want some data. So I asked Google how many people that is on the planet today. 7.5 billion people on the planet as of 217. Now let's say if we're talking about a remnant, all right? If a remnant was 10% of 7 billion, do you know how much that is? That's 750 million people. I think the number's too large. What about 1%? Would that be close to being a remnant? 1% of 7.5 billion is 75 million. And 0.1% of 7.5 billion is still 7 million. I'm using this so we can look at reality. Not we're looking that we know numbers and everything's going to appear. Yes, we'll be there at that hour, that time. But let's say it is 1%. How do you fit 75 million people? There's only 8 million in, Jerusalem, in Israel now. How do you fit 75 million if it's 1%? in there. Well, let's bring the number a little lower. Let's say it's 0 0.1%, 0 0.01, or 1, 0.1%, I should say. That's seven and a half million. And if the bride's all going to be there, and they're going to be brought there to separate the sheep and the goat, how much time do you think reality, because remember, those are mortal people. They're not living in, in fantasy world. How long is that going to take? So I'll just whet your appetite for next week. But somewhere, some, somewhere someone has to start looking at some things, things in the scripture. We have to start looking in a terms of it has to be re, real or Plausible that these things could take place. Well,
So when are you getting your crown? You still remember? Right. Right here. Now when he appears, now, now you've got to look at it in this manner. He does appear for the rapture, the dead in Christ shall, ri shall rise first, we alive be remaining. But the judgment has to be done for, the, for what rewards you're going to have at his appearing is the climax of what took place in that half hour silence. And in that half hour silence where you and I are going to receive our crown. And knowing what our reward is, not only that, we're going to be changing the twinkling eye and we will have a resurrected body and the marriage takes place in the air when we meet him in the air. Praise the Lord. Well, I feel good. So I'd have to say, where is the spirit of prophecy, and, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ, in the third watch? Oh, I can hear it. You're trying to make something of yourself. Uh, well, if I am trying to make something of myself, God has a way to destroy it. He does. True revelation cannot be destroyed. God can enlarge on truth or open the picture a little bit brighter and better. Oh. Praise the Lord. Are you happy? Yeah. I am. Yeah. So knowing the sequence here, again, he opens the seals in heaven. Then the crowd in heaven says, you're worthy to receive the kingdom. After that's done, then the angel comes down to us. Because having received the kingdom, he received it up there, and he has come down. And when he's down here in Luke, he says, he's already has received that authority. Can you see the picture? Is this complicated? It's complicated if, you're, if you've only been in the, the message for a year or two. But if you've been in the message for so many years, surely. Now, I don't expect everyone to see every nuances and every detail. As long as you have an overall picture because there's 30-fold, there's 60-fold, and 100-fold. So praise the Lord. All right, let's just stand to our feet at this time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for what you have given us. Lord, it's your word. And Lord, you're the one that will vindicate your word. All man can do, Lord, is just speak what you would give. Now, Lord, in this remaining service, have your way. And Lord, we're ever so thankful. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Lord, bless each one. All right. All right, you can all go because we've been on, on overtime, so.